Hey everyone, I'm Eric Kripke, uh, showrunner of The Boys. Warning, this interview is literally nothing but spoilers. So if you haven't watched, uh, stop this immediately, go to Prime Video, watch The Boys, then come back and hear me ramble on about it. Well, I love that we were able to incorporate, um, you know, the, the VNN segment into the show. I mean, it's a clear parallel to, to Fox News and, you know, kind of the agendas that that network is pushing, you know, that or OAN or any of these things that, you know, there are these clear talking points that they want to get out there and you just see them repeated ad nauseum. And it's bull****. It's clear bull****. It's just meant to rile people up and get them freaked out. And I think VNN really captures that well. And and the actor who plays Cameron Coleman, I think is like, he's like, he's perfect for that part. He's, he really nails it. A VNN special report, a nation betrayed. It's been five days and still nothing but lies from Vought. Soldier Boy is still out there and Maeve is still missing. Miss Barrett, your reaction? Once again, Maeve is in rehab, and the Soldier Boy thing really takes the cake. He died in 84. She is trying to incite a panic. I wonder if Starlight's actions could be considered treason. Me too. So is Starlight just hysterical? Another woman scorned after Homelander jilted her? Or is she trying to change the subject? From what? Her ties with this woman, a known terrorist with the Shining Light Liberation Army, a notorious human trafficking ring. Connect the dots, Cameron. I was so excited to work with Paul Reiser. I, Aliens is one of my very favorite movies of all time. He's incredible in it. He's incredible in everything he does. And he brought such, I, I only really worked with him for like two or three scenes. Every scene, I just watched him and learned from him. He brought something new and different to every take. He was funny. He had real pathos to him. I mean, he's a, he's a legend, you know. Uh, his, his character is called The Legend and Paul Reiser is a legend. He's just a wonderful man as well. He's just a wonderful person. Um, so I, I want him back for however long we go, I want Paul Reiser around. They're all the same. I mean, they're not all the same. Yeah. Come on, Soldier Boy was a hero, right? I mean, he stormed Normandy. <laughs> yeah, he did. Two weeks after D-Day for the photo op. So he didn't see any action? Not in Germany. Sprayed a fire hose at Birmingham. Some target practice at Kent State. <sighs> There were rumors about Daily Plaza. Wait, what? Yeah, and they call them the good old days. The thing is, to be American means knowing you're the hero. So what do we do? We sweep all our filthy shit under the rug, and we tell ourselves a myth like Soldier Boy, and I get stinking rich selling it. I love Nathan Mitchell so much. Um, he brings so much to the character of Black Noir. He's so serious about that role. Um, and you can see the work. I'm so happy that uh, we really get into his uh, backstory and his psyche because um, he's such a gifted actor and he does it all, you know, a lot like Karen Fukuhara. He does it with no words. And Nathan doesn't even have the luxury of using his face. Um, so he's, I, I don't know. I just, I can't sing Nathan's praises enough. And I'm so heartbroken about Black Noir. Um, we were able to make this character who initially people were just, you know, I, I not that the character is a joke, but he's funny in the sense that he n never talks and, you know, he would have like fun moments. Uh, but you were able to infuse so much heart, uh, into him this season. Um, I think the writers really, made him tragic. Um, and I loved all the animated sequences with like the great Eric Bauza voicing a lot of the cartoons. Uh, like he does the Looney Tunes. Irving, sooner or later, you're gonna have to, 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 to talk about it. And also in this episode, uh, Soldier Boy is continuing his, you know, his bucket list of people he needs to confront. Part of Butcher and his deal is that Butcher will help him uh, check off his vendetta list, and on that list is is one of his uh, one of his team members, Mindstorm. One of the things that I really love about Episode Seven is. Um, 
we get to really explore Butcher's childhood, you know, through this superhero Mindstorm who sort of taps him and sort of forces uh, Butcher to like relive really where he came from. You know, it's like what I always say about Butcher is um, you don't have to like him, but you have to understand him. And, you know, I think we really learn a lot about Butcher. Um, you know, we meet his brother Lenny for the first time. Um, we understand what their relationship was like. Um, you see what his relationship was like with his father and like the horrific abuse he had to endure. You really see the origin of, of Butcher's brutality and really how it's passed down from father to son um, as, as sort of these toxic male relationships keep continuing generationally. Lenny, I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> Kripke and I always, you know, talked about specifically what happened. We alluded to it uh, in the scene with John Noble, who plays Butcher's father in season two. Uh, so to sort of finally sort of see what Butcher's childhood was like and then to come to understand how the impact of that affected him and, and made him who he is, it sort of buys the audience some understanding as to, oh, okay, well, that's why Butcher was so inept at being a father figure for Ryan because he never knew what a father role model, a healthy role model, a paternal role model was like. He just doesn't have that skill set. And that's why it was important to me that those scenes be in there because, you know, after after the sort of the, the Ryan relationship went so tragically wrong, I, I think that it was really important for audiences to, to really come to understand that. And no one can stop you. Can they? No! I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry for what? I, I, I really like that Huey um, kind of understands more where Butcher's coming from because Butcher gives very little away when it comes to Huey, you know, and in his scenes with Huey, he doesn't really get too uh, introspective or personal. It doesn't show a lot, but for Huey to kind of have that info and gain this new appreciation for him, I think was really sweet. I, I really enjoyed in that episode that Huey's whole motivation is trying to save Butcher um, because they were at odds for quite a while, like throughout most of season two, and the beginning of season three, like they're they're at odds. So it was really nice to play them, even though they're they're together in this very um, messed up, codependent, uh, drug addicted way. It was really nice to see them uh, really be friends again and be a duo again. Uh, in a lot of ways, Butcher's all Huey has in that moment. So I, I really like that. I, towards the end of this, se this season, we're emphasizing just how close these two are and how they are like, a, you know, older brother, little brother relationship. And every season, I love working with Carl so much. And I love how we're able to kind of renegotiate the dynamic between the two of them. And it's always changing and, and getting deeper. And uh, yeah, I, I really like especially working with Carl this season and, and seeing the twists and turns that that relationship takes. Soldier Boy finally gets to confront uh, or has a nice chat with Mindstorm. And by that, I mean crushes his skull with his shield. To me, as... Um integral as those flashbacks were i think equally as integral is uh watching the sort of post flashback effect on butcher when they're back at the house and and he's sort of really strug struggling to process what he's just experienced um, because it really taps into the his deepest pain and and guilt about letting lenny down uh and then just sort of seeing how butcher covers that up and buries it away again, and then is like back on mission with Huey. Oh 
Danke. Kimiko never wanted powers. She did not choose it for, for herself. And so she's always wondered what her life would be like as a normal girl, normal woman, um, living a regular life. And she's finally had this opportunity in the hospital when she wakes up, she's actually kind of relieved. She's delighted. Through the events that happen in season three, she has she realizes that um, it's not really her powers that have uh, put her in this position, and that she has to uh, own up to her past. And it's about how she uses the power. I think that's a lot about what the boys, the show is about, um, how one person uses their power and how they choose to do good or bad with it. Um, and the influence that they can have. And so uh, Kimiko also has that as well, and she has to uh, reclaim her powers um, later on. Yeah. Is this really you? The situation's changed. I thought we should have a conversation. I don't know who the f you think you are. But you got lucky once because you f ambushed Ball me. 1980. I get called into Vogelbaum's lab for an experiment, some f about genetics. I still remember the penthouse I used. June. Danielle Deneau, bush like a Pomeranian. What? I beat my meat into a cup. Turns out, Vogelbaum made a kid. Born spring, 1981. A boy. You know what the b of it is? If they'd have just kept me around, I'd have let you take the spotlight. What father wouldn't want that for his son? In an episode that's really about fathers and sons, and it's about you know Butcher and his father, and and it's also revealed that Soldier Boy is Homelander's father. I read that in the script and audibly gasped. Like you don't see it coming, and then when you when you hear it, you go, "Oh, of course," you know. And I, I think those are the best twists, the ones that are in, in front of your face um, the whole time. That is something that that was not in the comics but something that Eric took some creative liberty with. And I think makes for, uh, that's, in my opinion, that's gotta be the biggest WTF of the season. Rhea, it's an interesting um, conundrum for both characters, but particularly for Homelander, you know, he's always been looking for love and connection and, and the, the realization or the revelation that he has a father really drives home his need or really resurfaces that craving that he has for family. You start to understand how the notion of just this toxicity is, is past. When you look back over the season, you will see all of these parallels that we've drawn between them in terms of uh, uh, Crimson Countess, you know, Soldier Boy's relationship to Crimson Countess versus Homelander's relationship to Maeve. Um, they say a lot of the same things. You know, they do a lot of the same things. And at the, at the time, you think, oh, it's because they were both, you know, big superhero celebrities. But then comes this, this reveal that it's, it's actually it's a little bit, that behavior is a little bit in their blood. I didn't know that that was happening until I was already in production. And, and then I got the script and was like, what? And it called Eric. I was like, you could have told me. He's like, eh, we didn't know. <laughs> Or maybe he did and he just didn't want me to play that. Uh, he's, he's crafty like that. And as a fan of the show, I was like, uh, <clears throat> So then I immediately started to shift the, uh, the, the performance a bit to be, one, a little more similar to what Ant does with Homelander because now there's, there's a genetic similarity uh, but also, I paid close attention at what Homelander's relationship uh, with, uh, with his son was and started to, to play into that because that then played itself out of like, well, maybe Soldier Boy really wants to have a relationship with his son. And maybe 
Butcher's idea of him uh, taking down Homelander isn't what isn't what Soldier Boy wants anymore because now it's like it's his kin. Um, so it really complicates the situation in a in a amazing way, and you then and, and that then is a, a great catalyst for for uh, revealing kind of Soldier Boy's insecurities and deep desires uh, because now he has he's faced with really a, a, a complex situation of does he dethrone his replacement or does he embrace the fact that it's his son?